What's in your future? What do you want to do with your life? What's next? These are questions that we all ask to different people uh, at different points uh, in life, and all of them pertain to the future. We especially love to ask these questions of young people. When kids graduate or they're getting close to graduating or when they're in high school, what do we love to ask them? Hey, what do you want to do with your life? And as parents always say, it's move out of my house, right? Many times that's the way that it is. But, but we are very interested in what the future holds, and we love to have a vision for our life moving forward. We, we love to have, we love to be able to look into the future and be able to say, man, that, that's where I'm headed. That's where I'm going. Here's the problem. Life happens. And what do you do when the future that you had aimed at doesn't come to pass because something happened in life? Right now, there is great concern for those of us who are parents of of young children, teenagers, even young adults, there is great concern about the future because of our kids. Because our society is on a highway to perdition. And we are greatly concerned about that. Well, As Peter closed out his second letter to Christians in the first century, he addressed this whole issue of the future. And I've entitled our thoughts today, Hope for the Future. Hope for the Future. The Christians uh, in the first century were living, uh, there was a lot of things going on in the Roman Empire uh, at at that time. Uh, and in, when he wrote the first uh, epistle, the first letter uh, to uh, the Christians in Asia Minor, uh, Peter was very concerned about the external persecution and the suffering that they were enduring. But this is a more general letter to Christians in areas not specified geographically. But Peter addresses, as he closes it out, he addresses the issue of the future, and he looks to breathe incredible amounts of hope into people's hearts. Here's a question that Brenda and I were talking about week before last, uh, and we haven't finished the conversation, but I think it's a very good question uh, before we get to the text today, and it is this. Is it possible to live a life of faith without hope and optimism? Is it possible to live a life of faith without hope and optimism? Hope and optimism are obviously future things because we don't have them yet. And I'm not sure that we can live a life of faith without an enduring sense of hope and optimism. So, for those of us who have more of a pessimistic outlook on life, for those of us who have a hard time finding hope, I want to I want to let you know what the enemy is doing today. He is looking to rob you of your faith and fill you with fear. Because if you're fe- if you're full of fear, you're not going to live in faith. And nor are you going to have hope about the future. You're just going to hope you make it through today. That's as far as the future goes for you. That's not what God wants. Let's look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to start with verse 3. We'll read through the first part of verse 15. First Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. That's Genesis 1 and 2, by the way. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. That's Genesis 6. 
And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. Verse verse 8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Verse 11, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire. And the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are not looking forward, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember, Our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. So we're talking here about the second coming of Christ. There are very few subjects that I like to communicate about more than the second coming of Jesus. I just enjoy uh, preaching. I enjoy teaching on them uh, because there is such incredible detail. We, uh, We... And that's part of where our hope comes from. We have hope because we know a great deal about what's going to happen and how things are going to happen as we prepare for the return of the Lord. We don't know everything, but we know a whole lot more than what we think we know. God has revealed it to us in his word. So there are three things here about Christ's second coming uh, that, that we're going to see. Three things about God. Uh, with relation to his second coming that we're going to go through. And at the, at the end of each one of these points today, I'm going to be asking you a question, and that's where the application comes in. Because here's the deal. If we don't respond to God's word today, we're not going to become more like Jesus today. And isn't that the point? To become more like Jesus today? So let's be disciples today. Let's be followers of Jesus and be doers of the word by responding to God's word as we leave this place today. So, the second coming of Christ. First thing we see is the promise of God. And of course, the promise of God that Peter talks about here in 2 Peter 3, the promise of God is the promise of his second coming. Now, God keeps his promises. God has never made a promise that he hasn't kept. He's never made a promise that he's not going to keep. God is not a politician. It's one of the great things to love about God. God is not like me. There, I have given my word to people in the past. I have made promises, especially as a child. I promise that, I promise, I promise, I promise. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've made promises that I haven't followed through on. And I'm sure you have too. But God is not a man that he should lie. God keeps his word. And if God said it, that means it's going to happen. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. God came to this earth in the person of Jesus 2,000 years ago as a baby in a manger to make provision for our sins so that we could be saved from the wrath of God. He is coming at his second coming, not as a baby, but as a conquering king. His feet will once again come to this earth and he will squeeze between his toes the very dirt that he made centuries ago. What an awesome thought about our God. But with regard to the promise of God, he has promised us that he's coming and he's promised us some things about this world in which we live. First of all is this, that the current world, this current world in which we are living will be destroyed by fire. That's how it's going to end. 
Now think about that. We, saw, we have seen in the 20th century particularly, we saw what fire can do to two cities in Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We saw what fire can do, intense heat can do to cities. We saw it take out a few hundred thousand people. I want to let you know that there are 7 billion people on this planet. Most of them are not going to make it into eternity with Christ. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few are they that find it. But broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are those who pass on it. There are going to be billions of people, think about this, whose death will come through that kind of heat. I cannot fathom it. I cannot imagine how that's going to happen on a global scale, but that's what God says. He says the earth will be destroyed with the fervent heat and the elements, the things that make up the heavens, not the abode of God, but the heavens above us. That's what we're talking about, and that's what Peter's talking about. They will be destroyed with intense heat, just like God brought land up out of the water at creation and then flooded that water and destroyed the world in Genesis 6 during the worldwide cataclysmic flood that took place and everybody died. This time, that same God is going to speak and fire is going to destroy this earth. That's, that's a promise from God. But the second part of that promise is that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Now, God is not going to destroy his abode. We're not talking about heaven where God dwells. You and I will live in the new heavens and the new earth. We're not going to live up in the clouds somewhere in some distant area. The new heavens and the new earth, that's where we're going to live. 2 Peter 3 says it. It's going to be a world where righteousness dwells. And the word new here, there are two words new, used in the New Testament uh, uh, to, uh, uh, for new. The first one is, is used to, uh, to mean uh, what was not there before. It's the word neos. So when a baby is born, we would say, if we were in first, the first century Greek culture and Roman culture, we would say that baby is neos. It's new. It hasn't been here before. That is not the word used here by Peter when he speaks of the new heavens or the new earth. The word that he uses is kainos, which means new in its nature, different from what is usual, impressive, better than the old. It's, it's not brand new, but it will be destroyed, and then God will recreate, as it were, and renew and redeem this world, and it will be as Edenic as it was in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. This is what is coming. This is the promise of God. When Jesus comes, it's going to be awesome. Question is, where are you going to land on that great day? This is the promise of God. And so the question that I have for you today is this. Have you lost sight of eternity? When you go through your day, is it all about the temporal is it all about what's around you? That's not how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live with an eye to eternity. Everything in this world, all of our cars, all of our homes, all of our precious things that we try to sell at our garage sales, you know, and all that kind of stuff that we think is, you know, more valuable than, that's just the way that we do. Every human does that. If, we go to, if I go to sell something that I've had for a while, I'm going to ask something, and you're going to look at me cross-eyed like, what? It ain't worth that much, but it is to me. All that stuff, up in smoke. It's going to burn. That's, that's what Peter's saying here. He's saying, yes, we live here now, and yes, we are supposed to, to live for the Lord, but make no mistake about it, God has promised that what we're experiencing right now is going to pass away every last part of it because God has prepared for us a new heavens and a new earth where perfect righteousness dwells, and we live godly lives now in preparation for that world, in preparation for eternity. We are getting geared up for what is coming because God has made us a promise. Have you lost sight of eternity this morning? If you have, you need to correct that. Secondly, Peter talks about the patience of God. The patience of God. 
Now, Galatians 5 tells us that patience is part of the evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in my life. If you are impatient, that is a moment that I know you are not operating in the spirit, but you are operating in the flesh. How many of you struggle with patience? Okay, there's a few honest people, yeah. And how does it usually manifest? How does impatience usually manifest itself? That's right, anger. We get mad. That's where it goes. Boom. If you got a problem with anger, it goes to impatience, most likely. God is patient. He's more patient than you or I. I'm so thankful for school teachers that were patient with me. I'm so thankful for parents that were patient with me. My mom used to always tell me growing up. I mean, she just said it all the time. Kenny, we're just, we're just skinny pigs. We've never done this before, and you're not like your brother. So we've never raised you before. We're guinea pigs. What's she doing? She was being patient because sometimes my folks made mistakes, and when my folks made mistakes with us parenting, they were never afraid to admit it. That's good parenting. You make mistakes. You screw up, right? Grandparents do the same thing. Even great-grandparents can do it. We make mistakes. The question is, are we being patient? Well, Peter talks about God, and he says God is patient, and in fact, God's patience is a key that allows for salvation. His patience allows for salvation. I'm so grateful for God's salvation. Aren't you glad, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, aren't you glad that the second coming didn't happen before you came to Christ? Because I'll tell you where you'd be if that would have happened. You'd be in hell today. But because God is patient and because of his great love for us, he waited and he waited and he waited. And he said, he said my wife was patient with me. I think I dumped her, was it four times? I can't remember. I, n- I never struck out, so I think I got a foul tip. Yes. So we dated four times. I dumped her three times. You know, so I said, ooh, strike one, strike two. Who foul tip. Okay, now we're married. Marital bliss. Next week, it'll be 23 years. It's amazing. And it just keeps getting better. When you do marriage God's way, it just gets better. I love that. It's incredible. It's incredible. But my wife was patient with me while I was trying to get my head screwed on straight and all this kind of stuff. My mom asked her one time. She said, she said, Brenda, I'm so sorry for, for our son <laughs> and that he's done this to you again. <laughs> and Brenda just remarked to her, well, God just must have somebody better for me. And he did because God changed me. He changed me. And so she got a better me because God is patient. God's patience allows for salvation. God is patient with people. We long to be free from the sin and the depravity in the present world. We, we, we long for that. And yet God's word reminds us that with all that is going on in our society, we got to understand that God is being patient. God is being patient with America right now because he wants Americans to put their faith in Christ. Is that how you think about it? Is that how I think about it? I love the way Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 19. Even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I will do whatever it takes. If I have to to pick up a way of life over here that is not sinful in order to lead a person to Christ, I will do that. 
I will do whatever it takes, Jew, Gentile, law abider, non-law abider. I will do what it takes. And I wonder if we are as patient with people as God is. And I know that we're not. So how much more do we need to daily lean on the Holy Spirit and the patience that he can and he alone can provide for us? And here's the thing about God's patience. Though it allows for salvation, that will not last forever. Romans chapter 1 tells us that God will unleash his wrath. And it's not on innocent people. Every person who will spend eternity in hell will not be innocent. There's not one innocent person in hell. Not one. Everybody's guilty. And friends, apart from Jesus, we're guilty. And only because of Jesus can we be seen as not guilty. Because God chooses to view us when our faith is in Christ. He chooses to view us through what Christ did on our behalf, not through what we are trying to do on our own behalf. God's patience will not last forever. And so in light of that today, in light of the patience of God, I ask you this question. Have you lost sight of God's mission? God's mission is that we would seek people out to lead them to Christ. That is the primary reason why you have an occupation. That is a primary reason why you have people in your life, to lead them and point them to Christ. That is the number one reason. As a child of God, have we lost focus? Have we lost sight of that mission? Have we lost sight of it? It's a question that we need to answer in light of the second coming of Christ. And that brings us to the third reason for hope. And this one's going to shock some of you. But Peter talks about it. It's the people of God. The people of God are supposed to be beacons of hope in a world that is lost without Christ. And God says, in, through Peter, he said, in light of all of these things about my second coming, what kind of people should you be in holy conduct and godliness? You wondering what kind of person God wants you to be? Second Peter 3 answers that question. He wants you to live in holy conduct, and he wants you to live a godly life. Verse 11. That's what he tells us. This is a constant theme in the letters of Peter. Peter says... Be holy. He, he, he quotes the Old Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1. Be holy because I, God, am holy. We are to lead holy lives. God has called you. He has called me to be holy. He has set us apart. And when we have our eyes on eternity, when we are locked in to the mission of Christ, we understand that living a godly life is so important because before people want to hear what we have to say, they want to see who we are. And it is when they, when they look at me, do they hear me talk like the world? Do they hear me behave like the world? Do they, do they hear me? Uh, what do they see in my life? Am I different? Jesus was different. He wasn't weird. He was different. He bucked the status quo. And any offense that he gave was in the path of salvation. He wasn't offensive just as a human being. He was offensive in his teaching because who wants to hear, you're on your way to hell? That's offensive, but it's true apart from Jesus. Apart from Jesus. We are to be holy people living with holy conduct and godliness. And then verse 14, he reiterates, That we are to be spotless and blameless. In fact, he says there in verse 14, he says, Make every effort with all diligence be spotless and blameless. Be spotless and blameless before God. Where are we spending our energy and our time? Are we spending our energy working in concert with the Holy Spirit so that we can lead blameless and spotless lives? Or are we trying to do our own thing? Guess what? As followers of Jesus, we don't get to set the agenda. But the agenda that God has for us is better than any agenda we would ever set for ourselves. As you review the last seven days of your life, 
Could you say that you have made every effort, as Peter says, to live a spotless and blameless life? How would I answer that question? How do you answer that question? The second coming of Christ gives us reason to live in this way. We have our sights aimed on our future home, but we are not content to wait idly in this life waiting for eternity. God said prepare for eternity by living godly lives, by living holy lives, by being spotless and blameless in a world that is corrupt and full of garbage and sin and stand out as a beacon of light and hope because Jesus is coming again. And so with regard to the people of God, of which you would be one if your faith is in Christ, have you lost sight of living like Jesus? Have you lost sight of living like Jesus? You're just hoping that when you hear the trumpet sounds, are you hoping that you go? Or are you convinced? Because like Peter said, he said, when we apply ourselves in this way, you know, James said it, we've been saying it throughout this uh, series in First Second Peter, faith without works is dead. And the holy conduct and godliness and blamelessness and spotlessness, that has to do with the things that we do and how we are living in life. Have you lost sight of living like Jesus? There is hope for the future, but it's not found in the next presidential election. It's not found in the halls of Congress. It's not amongst the oligarchy that exists in Washington, D.C. It's not going to be found in Helena, Montana. Hope for the future is not going to be found in the greatest scholarship that our kid could ever get, a full ride, you know, for 28 years or whatever. Now, hope is not found in the fact that your kid moves out of your basement, you know, I mean, you can hope for that, but that's not the ultimate hope. The ultimate hope that we have as followers of Jesus, the reason that we can be filled with optimism and hope is because of the promise of God that He is coming again. And my fear is that as the people of God, we have lost sight of eternity. We have lost sight of God's mission. We don't care. We don't care if unbelievers are in here or not on the weekend. I do. They better be. I had one pastor uh, who, who reprimanded one of, one of his staff members because they posted on social media a picture of everybody in the, in the church facility that they could see had their hands up. Uh, and his staff member had said, so great to see everybody worshiping God. And he pulled him aside and he said, we don't post stuff like that because that means there was no lost people in our services. And if we don't have lost people in our services, it's a reflection of what's happening during the week. So I am thankful That each week there are people far from God that are in here with us. But have we lost sight of eternity? Have we lost sight of the mission? Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. Have we lost sight of living like Jesus? If we have, then our level of hope is definitely fading and shrinking. And I'm here today to tell you, we just need to look again to Jesus. Because he's the one that can fill us afresh and anew. Don't you think Central Montana needs us this in the next seven days to live like we believe what the Word says? Every time that I read it, that I speak about it, shivers go down my spine and goosebumps go down my arms because the first thing I'm asking, Ken, are you ready? I mean, it, it caused, the fear of God causes me to, to check my faith. Am I blind to the lost around me? And sadly, too many days the answer is yes. And it's time for that in my life to end. And if that same is true in your life, it's time for that to end because that's not God. That is not God. God gives us hope for a future because He is coming again. But in coming again, we don't wait idly by. Peter said, Hasten the day by being about the Father's business. Will you stand with me this morning? 
And if you're here today, and maybe in your own heart you know that you've lost sight a little bit or a whole lot of eternity, or you've lost sight of the mission of Jesus, or you have lost sight of living like Jesus, and you know the Holy Spirit's just been kind of pressing on your heart, as I pray, would you join me? Because that's where it starts, but the real change happens when you walk down those steps and out that door. That's where, that's where the, pr- the proof is going to be in the pudding. That's where we're going to see if we're disciples of Jesus, if we're followers of Christ, doing what he has said. So Jesus, today, we bow our hearts before you, and God, humbly, we, we acknowledge our sin, that we have gotten caught up maybe in a lot of horizontal stuff. We have not paid attention to living like you. We have, we have not paid attention to your mission. We have not paid attention to eternity. We're pretending like everything is the same, like nothing's ever going to change. And for some of us, we've been trying to make the change apart from you. And so, Lord, for any and all of that, we ask for your forgiveness today. But God, we thank you for the hope that you give to us. We thank you that we are not living in vain. And we thank you that today you are with us. And so through the work of your Holy Spirit, help us to live like you as we go from this place today. May eternity be in view. May your mission be in view. May living like you be in view. May we offer hope to this world, hope for the future to the people that we contact this week. And God, if some of us are afraid to... to to open up and, and, and maybe be proactive in talking about these things. I pray that you would surround us with people who will ask questions so that we'll have to answer. God, make up for our, our frailties and our weaknesses and, and, and those things in, in that way, I pray. Father, we're so thankful that we can live forever. God, may we be found holy and righteous in you. And God, may our hearts wake each day to the excitement of your soon return and may we be about your business until you come. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go from this place today and give hope to somebody because somebody around you needs the hope that Jesus has to offer. God bless you as you go today.